So Weird Economies uh, introduction. Uh, Weird Economies was born out of a desire to act upon the tensions between the speculative activity of art and the speculative activity of capital as it's unfolding today. Um, in The Value of Everything, art theorist Suhail Malik elaborates the relation between the inde indeterminacy of contemporary art and its financial variance. Malik here follows the arguments that prices putative subordination to value in the realm of contemporary art, uh, Adorno's description of art as absolute commodity being irreducible to its price, is the very condition for art's fair valuation. Um, as the absolute authority um, in the valuation of everything in the form of price, from art to real estate to luxury goods. Since price in contemporary art is set in relation to art's reputational regime upheld by its institutions rather than the cost of goods or material constituents of artworks, we could say that prices are derivatives of other prices. Subsequently, if it is the current and future reputation that informs current and future prices, value is nothing but a recognition of the established power in the art field. That is, it is power or distribution, not value, liberated from production and supply and demand that determines art prices. The accumulation of capital and power that designates prices, Malik adopts political economist Nitsan and Bichler's framework is called finance. Contemporary art's formal logic of indeterminacy, that is, is synchronous with the formal interplay of prices set by financial derivatives. In pricing and exchange in the future, derivatives operate by leaving open the possibility of revision, and so they trade in contingency. Elena Esposito's inquiry into the time of finance informed Malik's arguments that time of financial markets, as Esposito remarks, is abstract and reflexive, an order of time that modern society is not yet accustomed to. Derivatives leave open the indeterminacy of the future while producing it via their decisions. They produce indeterminacy while reducing it, quoting Elena Esposito. The very process of contingency internalized by derivative prices describes what Ulrich Beck calls the society of risk, a society that orients its conditions for self-reflexivity towards an unknown future rather than a stable past. Social normativity and its regulating capacities then in a society at risk comes under the reign of reflexivity. The result is then contingencies of power, not least those advanced by financial markets, substituting the normative order uh, with a social quasi-order. The 2008 financial crisis for many presaged the primacy of speculative capitalism. In keeping with the canonical stance that sees art as subsumed by apparatuses of capital accumulation, Responses to such diagnosis, for the most part, have remained descriptive rather than propositional. If speculation as a mode of production is the modus operandi of art and finance alike, the question is then what can art as a speculative practice do to challenge the ontological promiscuity of financialization capital we have today? Ultimately, if there is a chance for this intervention via speculation, what can art achieve with this social technology and formal techne to challenge the sum of socio-computational engineering that constitutes finance? If we take art in its Kantian definition as speculative aesthetics, what else falls into its criteria at times of cross-disciplinarity qua critique of professionalization? So in economic science fictions, uh, William Davis frames the failure of imagination as the central challenge faced by economics and political science. A, predisp a predisposition to dyadic logics 
that capture economic discourse either within a capitalist market order or its unrealized planned socialist counterpart. Ultimately, Davis suggests the economy today looks as much socialist as liberal capitalist. The Silicon Valley sharing paradigm summons back past ideals of communal ownership, but not of the means of production, but of profitable goods and services. The current COVID-19 regime is in fact already, inf already infiltrating capitalist common sense with socialist agendas as conservative governments rush to endorse the wildest proposals of their opponents to curb the consequences. The apparent sublation of these predominant economic blueprints raises the question of whether their antinomy is a matter of epistemological oversight rather than holding an ontological status. Science fiction and other, other utopian writings, multiple mock futures, Davis recites Frederick Jameson, empowers the radical and the critic alike to see the present as receptive to necessary change. Jameson's consistent thesis on the postmodern closure of imagination is to argue that science fiction and the utopian genre uh, in local and determinate ways and with a fullness of concrete detail highlight our constitutional inability to imagine utopia itself. Science fiction's best vocation is then to render this very shortcoming of speculative thought in the place of representing the future, presenting the present as a future past. Utopia becomes a genre in our own time and is relieved of its radical task to provide an aesthetics of the future, not as an immediate encounter with the future, but as a medium. Science fiction reveals itself as the form of such representational attempts. Stripped of its futuristic calling, sci-fi becomes an advantageous instrument of present day political action. More specifically in Jameson's account, we are heirs to a politics passed on to us as historical determinism. That is, we can change the present, but we can't change the rules of political thought. It is in this respect that Weird Economies claims that sci-fi cannot formulate an adequate speculative politics. For one, at the core of this conjectural politics, sci-fi's reality setting, is a reductive form of linear and monodirectional rationality. This deficient chronopolitics itself is a symptom of sci-fi's domination by anthropomorphic tropes. Refusing the genre to sufficiently encounter the vexed question of agency that is central to the 21st century inquiry. The science that sci-fi imagines approximates the description given by Quentin Maida Sue as a field dominated by the Kantian notion of rule governing practices. And therefore its application to financialization exposes its speculative limits, but not in terms described by Jameson. According to Medasu, in science fiction, we generally inhabit a world where physics, theoretical or natural, differs from ours, but in which laws are not purely and simply abolished. Uh, in which everything and anything cannot happen in an arbitrary way or at any moment. In the case of financial phenomena, on the other hand, the concern of a speculative politics should be around the construction of radical time systems and aesthetics and epistemologies that pertain as well to non-anthropomorphic agents and non-representational forms. Could an interrogation of the human unit at the center of economic studies, the homo economicus as the healthy white man, potentially shift the operative time construct of Western modernist humanism that the economic clock is calibrated to? Following Davis's call, should not then one invent a concept that posits itself as a counterpart to science fiction? We call this new concept the weird. So the weird has been in circulation by many across the fields of culture, art, humanities, and social sciences in recent years. The concept banks on the affordances of a speculative genre such as science fiction 
yet accommodates a militant imaginary that surpasses the anthropometric confines of conventional literary forms. Jeff Vandermeer described the weird fiction as what emphasizes this beautiful unknown thing without immediately rendering it as lethal and horrifying. Writer Elvio Wilk locates a similar oddity in the knowledge delivered by female mystics in the Middle Ages that posed a danger to both institutions of church and science. Echoing Lacan's conception of mirror stage development, Wilk points to the distinction between the insane and the mystic as based in an understanding of the wholeness of the body where the insane fights tooth and nail to retain ontological security out of fear, the mystic willingly subsumes herself in a process of self-demolition. It could be inferred then that the weird stands in opposition to the sublime. Sublimity for Joseph Addison, an influence on Kant's theory of aesthetics, is formulated as how we come to grasp the object of greatness with terror. The weird, by contrast, is how we perceive our image as formed from the vantage point of an outside, an unrecognizable, amorphous selfie. The formlessness of the exterior space, the former sublime, is in this sense not an internal oddity, but is related to the deficiencies of our anthropometric capacities to capture otherly forms. The weird to Mark Fisher involves a sensation of wrongness. A weird entity or object is so strange that it makes us feel that it should not exist, or at least it should not exist here. Yet if the entity or object is here, then the categories which you have up until now used to make sense of the word cannot be valid. The weird as well captures the strange symbiosis between two registers of speculative activity financial speculation and aesthetic judgment. As finance has turned a household name in recent decades, artists across disciplines and mediums have engaged with the substance of finance, be it the material footprints of its mathematical processes or conceptual experiments modeled after its anticipatory technologies such as money. Seen from this perspective, money and art serve as an identical function as material receptacles of social and pecuniary abstraction. The weird, however, is the speculative drive that mobilizes both art and money beyond their limits as mere representational forms. Furthermore, weirding can be a way of plotting and socializing the future without repressing or essentializing its promissory potentials. While the crisis hit across class stratums and national territories in a differential logic, only few can hedge and profit from the collapse while it lasts. That is, the semantics of risk is lopsided towards the new information class. This is one reason why it is of great urgency today, as Eric Bordello writes, to invest in, a, in ways of risking and speculating together, to play on the double character of finance. For finance, rather than being delimited to monetary value, according to Bordello, um, could as well be remodeled as an artistic medium, a mode of coordinating the future and its emerging possibilities through the collective design of attractors and the distribution of flows of desire. This demands the invention of a new economic language capable of valuing beyond the singular metrics of money to make ex expressible activities, processes, and flows currently invisible and therefore immeasurable by capital's politics of valuation. Economy from the combination of Greek oikos and naiman refers to the management of the household. Freud's concept of the un unheimlich is not alien to economy in this regard if we dispose of its poor English translation, the uncanny, in favor of the more fitting, the unhomely, as Fisher also um, argues. Uh, weird economies aims to designate such unhomely governances of the, uh, of the household. If our anthropomorphic vision today is skewed towards the interior of these familiar and familial 
edifices. The question to be asked is which visualizing organisms and what modes of observation can help us view these unhomely economies from outside? So finally, um, while emphasizing the necessity of cross-disciplinary cooperation between post-capitalist thinkers and practitioners, weird economy stresses artistic imaginaries, again, art in its expanded sense, that are essential to this venture. That is, it endorses speculation as this methodology against the essentializing tendencies of certain strands of the left that delimit value to a matter of bureaucracy. It attempts to orient itself as a platform and a think tank at the times of aggregation of platform capitalism and find ways of changing the business as usual of platform economies in art and beyond. It's self-reflective of its own mechanics, systemic limitations and potentialities, and the accumulation of power and reputation that is a byproduct of any platform organization. It aims to distribute this accumulated cultural and pecuniary capital between its stakeholders. How to negotiate human social relations when law has transformed into code in the digitized translocal society? Can smart contracts resolve, um, can smart contracts um, resolve the historical deadlocks of conflict and negotiation? What kind of regulatory system is still desirable or should we relinquish that to organizing, distributive and decentralizing algorithmic procedures? Can weird economies act as a scale model for the platform comments to come? How can it locate and connect with its allies to build an ecology of commons-oriented platforms and think tanks? As an infrastructure for creating new wording visions and excavating pre-established commons-oriented practices, what governing and ownership models could it embrace? How can the form of the platform and its think tank space correspond to the thematics that the project is pursuing in multiplying visions of post-financialized futures? What kind of time scale can be imagined for these ideas to infuse, permeate, grow, and come to fruition within weird economies? And lastly, recent financial philosophies have pointed out possibilities to use the techniques of finance to subvert and reverse finance's own tendency to widen the accumulative effects of past injustice. Namely, Robert Meister's theorization of justice as a financial option and Michel Feher's description of practices of counter speculation or speculative insurgency in the current reputational regime. Feher, for instance, describes this program to be the political work of investing and raising the credit worthiness of discredited subjects and forms of knowledge. As a social realm entirely operating via reputational regime and politics of credibility, how can the art system lend itself to social experimentations around theories of financial justice? How can weird economies be conceived as a playground for these financial probes towards social justice?